With us this week from Grand Rapids, Michigan, Dr. Emerson Egerich is a former pastor. He's steeped in theology, communication, and family-related studies. And we have so much to unpack. Now, maybe you can identify with that moment that I do is a woohoo, but too quickly for some it becomes boo hoo. And the statistics tell us that is true. Dr. Egerich, uh, I, this little prop has a double meaning because uh, there is interestingly pink and blue here. Mm -hmm. That has become kind of a standard that you bear yes, in uh, yes. helping couples. Well, Jesus said, have you not read, he who made them from the beginning made them male and female. And uh, God made us male and female. And I like the fact that she looks through pink sunglasses and it colors what she sees. She wears pink hearing aids and it affects what she hears. She speaks through a pink megaphone and she expects her husband to know what she means by what she says because all of her girlfriends do. He, on the other hand, wears blue sunglasses. It colors what he sees. He wears blue hearing aids and it affects what he hears. He wears or he speaks through this blue megaphone and expects his wife to understand what he means by what he says because all of his buddies know what he means. And so what you have is this uh, male and female pink and blue difference. And so uh, here's an innocent illustration. She says, I have nothing to wear. Mm -hmm. What she means is she has nothing new. He says, I have nothing to wear. What he means is he has nothing clean. <laughs> and so Speaking we say the two same different word, mother yeah, tongues. Exactly. Same words. I have nothing to wear. I have nothing to wear. But we mean something different from what we say. And as I point out, that's a that's an innocent illustration. But as we get into intimacy with another person, suddenly we're trying to figure out well, what are you really saying here? Particularly if she filters things through the love grid and he's not trying to be unloving, but she feels unloved and, and or she ends up appearing disrespectful. She's not trying to be disrespectful, but he feels disrespected. So now who's right? And, and these are moments where we're trying to interpret, you know, each other. And that's where we said before that we get into this dance and we end up stepping on each other's toes. We are going to be meeting your beautiful daughter before this week is out. Joy is here as well. And um, I, I just chuckled at her first reaction to you even using stereotypical pink and blue. And you made another beautiful point about those colors and their significance in what God has called us to be in marriage. Yes. Well, there are a couple of things. One, the pink is very precious to us because my wife, Sarah, had a double mastectomy. So the pink ribbon that universally now displays the whole issue of cancer and, and uh, for women, it, it, that's a powerful, powerful visual. But when you put pink and blue together, it's purple. And if God made us male and female, husband and wife, to come together to reflect His image, He made us in His image, husband and wife. And so husband and wife coming together reflect the image of God. So when you put pink and blue together, it's purple, the color of royalty, the color of God. Husband and wife together reflect his image, his nature. God's not pink in that sense. God's not blue. God's purple. And together we reflect him. That's why it's a powerful illustration in that regard. Neither one of us are wrong. We're just different. We just have to figure out how to make this work. I am also deeply touched and impressed at how much of the richness of this ministry has come from brokenness. It it is wonderful. We're going to be talking in our next segment about how this principle works in the family because the family gets on the crazy cycle right. as well. Right. You, you lived in a crazy cycle. Yes. Well, and, and the crazy cycle deals with this Ephesians 5.33 passage where a husband is commanded to love and a wife is commanded to respect. And we've, we've looked at the fact that women have this pushback on the idea of respect, but men are motivated by this issue of honor. And we talk about it in our book, how do you do this when Women know how to be disrespectful, they'll say, but I don't know, really know how to do this respect thing. But people get on that crazy cycle. When a wife feels unloved, she tends to react in that way that feels disrespectful. The University of Washington said her eyes turn dark, the face turns sour, the hand on the hips, the scolding finger, the sigh, the rolling of the eyes, the head goes back. In a man's world, all of these are gestures of contempt. As I say, is there any person in his life that talks to, you, to him the way that you talk to him? And if the answer to that is no, then he's not hearing the deeper cry of your heart. Instead, he's thinking you're using this topic as another opportunity to send him a message. You don't like who he is. He's unacceptable. So what you have then is this crazy cycle. Without love, she reacts in a way that feels disrespectful to him, but she's not trying to be disrespectful. Then when he feels disrespected, he ends up reacting in a way that feels unloving to her. As we point out, men stonewall. 85% of those who just shut down, drop it, forget it. So now they're in that crazy cycle. And my mom and dad 
got on that crazy cycle. And they got on that crazy cycle in ways that were really out of line. Dad had rage issues, and so he uh, did not have a dad. His dad died when he was three months old. So he had this rage, and he attempted to strangle mom once. Uh, I remember witnessing that at age two and a half. So mom and dad divorced, but then they remarried each other, for which we're grateful, but then mom separated for many years. And so I experienced firsthand this kind of craziness in a relationship. Dad was not physically abusive. That was the only time that there was any moment like that. But he had anger and he would explode and he would do things. And so mom, to get us out of harm's way, uh, separated for many, many years. And then they both came to Christ later. My freshman year at Wheaton, my mom came to Christ, my dad came to Christ, my sister came to Christ, my brother-in-law who's a professor. In fact, my sister and brother-in-law live in Canada. He taught at the University of uh, uh, Manitoba in Winnipeg. And so uh, they are Canadians, and, but my whole family came to Christ, and we are so grateful for that. But that family of origin stuff has left a woundedness in me, but it has contributed to me becoming a wounded healer. Here's a brand new report on millennials. Your daughter is in that category, Joy. Uh, they're saying, I don't, to marriage. Mm -hmm. You're trying to change this dynamic in the ministry that your family, more and more of your family, is involved with. Young people are scared to right. do this. Mm -hmm. There's a fear that's under current there. And so they're living together without uh, committing with a thought that, you know, this will protect them perhaps from future pain and hurt. I spoke to 3,000 people in France and uh, many uh, live together. And I said to the women, the research points out that women will live with a man in order to prove to him that she loves him and that there is this worthiness in her. So she moves into that relationship with the thought that he, I uh, can win over. He, on the other hand, moves into that situation to determine whether he wants to be committed or not. So again, we see women are the ones who are taking in the throat. They're going to get hurt. They are not as afraid of commitment, though there are m millennial girls out there. But if a man was fully devoted, fully committed, so some of this fear is, is driven by the male, but also women have their fears as well. We're not minimizing that. But what we have to unpack is why are we so afraid of relationships? And, and really the question is, do we have the confidence to know how to do relationships? And this is why we wrote the book Love and Respect, that there's a simple way to, and as, as the University of Washington said, when they studied those 2,000 couples for 20 years in a laboratory setting, they said love and respect is the key to success. If you have love and respect, the attitudes of love and respect over the marathon of that relationship, it'll succeed. When there's contempt and hostility, it fails. People think if we don't have sex problems, money problems, in-law problems, child-rearing problems, if we can eliminate all these problems, we have a great relationship. The University of Washington said those really are secondary issues. The problem is when we talk about money, he comes at her with a hostile attitude. What'd you do with that $500? or if they talk about sex, is that all you think about, you animal? You, all you want is sex, sex, sex. It's the hostility and the contempt. It's this kind of attitude during the discussion of those issues that undermines the relationship. So when two people learn how to approach things lovingly and respectfully, even though we all fail, even saying, I don't know how to do this loving thing. I don't know how to be respectful. Even introducing it with the fact that I don't know how to do it is sufficient to keep the hearts connected with each other. So we're campaigning that there's a ton of hope for relationships, a ton of hope. You don't have to let fear control you. It's a matter of coming to grips with two ingredients. In fact, you only have to remember one of them, <laughs> as I say. If a man says, is that which I'm about to say or do toward her gonna feel loving or unloving? he'll probably succeed in that relationship. And if he doesn't know, he can ask her and she'll probably be able to tell him. And I want to make the point that this is not just in marriage. Uh, and what is popping into my mind, popping up like a pea in the blueberries, it, years and years ago, working at a television station, secular station, uh, a, a superior, a boss came into my office and he just wanted to talk about nothing important. And I had a lot to do that day. I was, uh, by the way, a brand new believer and I don't know what I said, I just dismissed him. I just made it clear, I don't have time for you to talk about nothing right now. And he, he just like a hound dog, he just turned around and walked away. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit came on me like, is that a way to treat your boss? And I walked down to Carpet City and I, there he was sitting at his desk, just defeated. He was just, I mean, I hadn't even been that harsh, but there he was crushed at his desk and I, had to hold back tears. The hand of God was on me so strongly.
hmm. about my behavior as I, I just simply apologized. Well, I'll tell you, our relationship was solid gold after that for the, all my days there. It just took a simple apology and that affirmation, that respect, mm -hmm. which was appropriate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it changed everything in a moment. Well, one of the things that people don't understand is that it's not rooted in egotistical, narcissistic attitude. Men have a vulnerability where women don't, just as women have vulnerabilities where men don't. You don't talk to a woman about a diet book, <laughs> right? Well, so too, when, when a woman gives the third marriage book, this year she's purchased for the two of them to read, he hears a message. I don't accept you, I don't approve of you, and I don't respect who you are, Buster, unless you change right now and become more loving like me. You are not what you need to be. That's right. So this is not egotistical. This is what I call a vulnerability. God made us different, and we have to come to a point where we say that's okay. It can lead to egotism and narcissism, just as there can be prima donnas. We can all create the exceptions, but we have to decide, is this person I'm married to a person of basic goodwill? And when I see the spirit of my spouse deflate, when I see them deflate, I always ask this, have you ever had a conflict when suddenly the issue didn't seem to be the issue? Mm. And you see the spirit of your spouse deflate. In yes. all probability, she's feeling unloved. And even if you're showing her disrespect and she's feeling disrespected, as I point out, if you show her disrespect for weeks on end, she'll say, how can you say you love me and treat me disrespectfully like this? Men, on the other hand, tend not to be insecure about a woman's love because women have been designed by God to love. Women love to love at the level of intimacy. So you say to a guy, does your wife love you? Absolutely. But he's not assured that she respects him. And it's this vulnerability that he has, particularly where she's upset with him and she's coming at him, he doesn't hear the deeper cry of the heart. Instead, he thinks you're just using this as another opportunity to send me a message you don't like who I am. Now, should he be bigger than that? Can we dis should we all just dismiss him and say, grow up? Yeah, I should say you should grow up too on a diet book. Maybe you need to lose some pounds for health reasons. But I would get crucified if I said that. Mm. But the point is, you're mature enough to be able to handle that from your girlfriend who gives you the diet book. Hey, should we do this diet together? But if your husband hands you that diet book, it is replete with symbolism, right? And so there is this, because it hurts you. My point is men have vulnerabilities in the relationship, but they don't break down and cry. They don't react in the way that a woman would react. They tend to stonewall and pull back, which then is interpreted as unloving. And he doesn't always put a voice in vocabulary, particularly if he, in the early years of the marriage, said, you're not respecting me. And she's, well, you don't deserve my respect. So now he's gone completely mum on this. He's quiet and he doesn't bring up what he's feeling. Now the book talks about how to do this respectful thing. And if women will introduce what I call the vocabulary respect and a few respect things, she will see her husband soften and move toward her rather than tighten up and move away. And we just encourage women, try this for six oh, weeks. Oh, uh, yeah, try it. It's amazing the, the impact. You know, a, a woman I met years ago said, Moira, I, I, this verse hit me d between the eyes, Ephesians 5.33. Uh, she said, I, I'm always praising workmen who come into our house. They live on a farm, but I never praise my husband. Well, a year later, uh, she came back and it was her sister who came to me and said, Moira, these guys are like newlyweds. They can't keep their hands off each other. <laughs> and it just was a little exactly. bit of affirmation yes. and respect, yes. a sobering, sobering lesson from it's the book. It's energizing his spirit. It's not feeding narcissism. This is where the culture somehow has misinterpreted our sons. And I say to every mother out there, how do you want your daughter-in-law to treat your precious baby boy? If we don't step back, then he is going to be treated in the way that this whole mindset and the culture is. And he's not a narcissistic, egotistical kid. You know his tenderness, you know his vulnerability, but he's not gonna break down and cry and he's gonna pull back and then he's gonna be labeled as unloving. But if that sweet daughter-in-law is coached by you to say, just honor his heart, not his bad behavior, just come across respectfully as you address these issues and watch what happens. The love you so desire will begin. It comes pull back. back on you. Oh, so many lessons. I'm glad we're back tomorrow. And guess where we're going? The crazy cycle in the family. So you're not going to want to miss it. Love and Respect, international bestseller at our e-store.